Hello, and welcome to the virtual Yale University Art Gallery. My name is Stephanie Wiles, the Henry J. Heinz II Director. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our fourth and final lecture in John Walsh's Lecture and Conversation series on Pablo Picasso at Yale. In this series, John explores the life and work of the most prolific and revolutionary artist of the 20th century, focusing on important works by Picasso present in the Yale University Art Gallery's collection and weaving them into a broader global framework. Three weeks ago, John introduced us to a young Picasso in Paris, to his work with Georges Braque, and the role the human figure played in Picasso's art. In this final lecture, Picasso, Life and Death, John Walsh discusses a painting in the Yale Art Gallery's collection, Picasso's First Steps. John Walsh is an art historian, curator, museum director, and educator. He graduated from Yale College in 1961 and earned his master's and doctorate from Columbia University. John has worked at the Frick Collection, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and served as the director of the Getty Museum for 17 years. He has taught at Barnard College, Columbia, Harvard, and now part-time at Yale. Walsh's commitment to the power of art and close looking and to nurturing aspiring scholars has benefited students, the gallery, and the Yale and New Haven community immeasurably. We are grateful for his participation in this lecture series, despite these challenging times. This series is sponsored by the Martin A. Ryerson Lectureship Fund. Each week in March, we have released a lecture on the gallery's YouTube channel on Thursdays at 12.30 p.m. The lecture will remain on YouTube and you can watch it at your leisure. The lecture will be followed by a live conversation with John, which we will host on Zoom on Fridays at 12.30 p.m. Tomorrow, March 25th, John will be joined by Maureen Theodore, Associate Curator of Programs here at the Yale University Art Gallery. We invite you to tune into the lecture on YouTube, bring your comments and questions to the Friday Zoom conversation, and remember, registration is required. Thank you so much for joining us today, and now, without further ado, I'll open it one more time to John Walsh and his fourth and final lecture, Picasso, Life and Death. Thank you very much, Stephanie. In this series, we've been occupied mostly with Picasso's main contribution to the history of art, Cubism, its origins, its metamorphosis from intentional obscurity to playfulness. You may have had the impression at times that Picasso was a kind of trickster, and more interested in visual surprises and even shocks than he was in treating serious themes. But in fact, from start to finish, he made images of genuine seriousness, even about life and death, drawing on his vast visual memory of earlier art and on his teeming imagination. We're going to look at a few of those subjects today. We'll spend much of our time on these two especially rich pictures, one at Yale and the other, the most famous of all his paintings in Madrid, in between, I will briefly review his early years and look at a few other pictures of his that touch on the theme of life and death. We'll start with this picture, which is about four and a half feet high. And to remind you where it hangs and to show you how big it is, I'm going to play a 20 second silent video and then a still image of the picture. So we'll pause for just a minute and look at it.
a little boy takes a step forward. He has the dress-like jumper that boy babies and boy toddlers still wore before World War II. His face is askew, cockeyed, his mouth is twisted. His big eyes are looking right at you. The woman, we assume his mother, is leans over him, craning forward at the neck, looking down towards his feet. Her face is twisted, too, with big, soft curves and with an expression of concern for him. She's holding his hands from underneath as though she's been supporting him, but his left hand is contorted and it looks like she's losing her grip. He's stepping out. One foot is planted and the other is raised so much that we see the sole of his foot. There's a shallow space, in other words, containing the figures. But a couple of other things are a bit odd. He's stepping up slightly to a low platform or ramp even that's there just for him. More obvious is that between his legs, there's a trapezoidal block filling the space as though the floor or the room have been built to support him and only him. You also see that she's a sturdy mom. She wears the modest black dress that many Mediterranean women in middle age and older wore and in some places still do. She's not very tall and she has a wide stance and she completely envelops her child. She's all curves and big soft volumes, whereas the boy, and it's hard to call him a baby, is all angles and flat planes. She has an indoor complexion, pale with some pink. His skin has faint greens and yellows. The only other colors are several shades of blue, all his. The body language says a lot. She stoops in a solicitous, protective way, and she looks down at him. He's moving straight ahead, like a little armored vehicle. The scale also expresses a lot. He's so much bigger than his mother that the effect is almost comical. He's bigger than life, in his own mind and probably in hers too. That reinforces his ignorant self-assurance and her parental dilemma too. Do a hang on or let him go? We're gonna come back to the picture after I give you a very speedy recap of Picasso's career up to this point, 1943. Picasso was born in 1881 in Malaga and grew up as the son of an art teacher, the man at the right in Picasso's own drawing at the age of 15. He was precocious, particularly as a caricaturist. His father is surrounded by thumbnails of friends of his and some of them show off his calligraphy. At the far left is a fashionably fluent portrait of a man by candlelight that Picasso painted at 18. And in the following year, he made two portraits of himself at the top, posing as an 18th century gentleman. He was barely out of art school when he became part of an avant-garde group of artists and writers in Barcelona, which saw itself as the Paris of Spain. And then he went to Paris. There he fairly quickly managed to get an exhibition of his colorful pictures of Café Society and the Demi Monde and the life of brothels and their staffs, all subjects that Degas and Toulouse-Lautrec had made their specialty there at the upper right. The theme of this talk is life and death in Picasso's work. His first encounter with death in his own generation was the suicide of his best friend, a high living, needy, erratic Spanish artist called Carl Casagemas, who blew his brains out over a girlfriend. In the middle is Picasso's strange, pious memorial to his friend, displaying his wound. 
he painted another much larger picture at the right, a kind of altarpiece that was bound to recall another burial image with mourning going on down below. <clears throat> In Picasso's picture, however, Casa Gemas is being welcomed up in heaven by a group of prostitutes, people that both Casa Gemas and Picasso had been seeing a lot of. In his early 20s, Picasso stopped celebrating the leisure time amusements of the well-to-do and dealt often with the poor and their precarious lives. During his so-called blue and rose periods, he treated undernourished mothers, caring for children and working themselves to the bone. In one case, he painted an ambitious allegory that he called La Vie. We've got a drawing that shows Picasso himself as the nude young artist with a model facing an older person. In the finished picture, Picasso's bowed out and instead, his dead friend, Casagemas, is the one who's receiving a lesson. A few years later, Picasso pre presented youth as something more promising. In the painting, the Museum of Modern Art, a boy leads a horse, striding forward confidently. This is consistent with the positive spirit of Picasso's older model and inspiration, Paul Cezanne, who paints a kind of modern day Eden with unashamed nude bathers. As for the world, as imagined by Henri Matisse, the living artist of, leading artist of his own generation in Paris, there's a kind of joyous fantasy of escape from the cold gray world of the present into a deliriously colored, guiltless paradise. Well, joyous escape was not for Picasso. His most ambitious picture at this point, age 26, had been a shock to everybody who got to see it. It's a picture of five prostitutes in their place of work, displaying themselves to you as a prospective customer. They're bigger than life, strained in their poses, kind of flattened cutouts put in a shallow space with curtains and what looks like fragments of glacial ice in between them. Two women at the right have heads like African masks and seem to have been bred with evil spirits. It's not only that Picasso's painting style or styles here was new to European art, but also that he made to, meant to make us upset and even fearful. These drawings show an earlier idea for the composition. There are two men here at the left. A customer uh, right in the middle, dressed as a sailor and resembling Picasso. And at the left, an unexpected visitor coming in. It's a medical student with a book, or in other versions like the one at the bottom, a skull. He arrives as a warning. This pleasure may be deadly. Picasso himself was terrified of syphilis and gonorrhea. He dropped the men and made the presence of death less explicit, but is still implied by the women in that weird, crumpled, uh, contorted space. During the next five years, Picasso went on to explore more new ways of deconstructing and reconstructing figures and the space they occupy. He often used traditional subjects that point to the inevitability of death. He reincarnates several of the fractured, flattened demoiselles as massive, weighty creatures in a green, vaguely jungle-like locale next to a fractured rock face. They exist in some kind of pre-civilized state before the necessity of clothing. His still life here shows an artist's habitat with painter's tools in the background and a picture within a gilt frame. And on the table, books and tobacco 
share space with a skull, the age-old reminder that death will put an end to knowledge and pleasure and striving. Moralizing disappears from the subjects that Picasso and his artist soulmate Brock chose during their several years of developing Cubism. They were mostly still lives and landscapes and some figures, and the paintings are mainly about disassembling appearances and giving them a new kind of visual coherence, much in the same way that composers and poets were doing at the same time. Picasso emerges from those explorations, like the nude at the left, ready to serve up less austere kinds of pleasure. Making collage seems to have liberated him. In fact, the pictures at the left and the, and the center are kind of before and after. At the far right, though, is a development just after World War I that's a lot harder to understand. The radical Picasso returning to academic discipline, realistic drawing, modeling. But this seems to have been a kind of escape from being trapped in himself and typed by others. The demure looking woman is Olga Kolkova, the Russian ballerina that he married after 25 years of bachelorhood and countless liaison. They would have a child, a luxurious life in the beau monde, and years of bitterness together. There are many paintings in Picasso's classicizing style, some of them full of quiet nostalgia on the left for remote times in antiquity, others just full of boisterous physicality. Picasso could return to a kind of cubism when he pleased for the rest of his life. And he often did with complete confidence and amazing ambition. Both of these pictures are about seven feet high, both complex animated compositions and utterly different in style. At the left is a picture that began as a composition of ballet dancers, which Picasso reworked into something truly scary, so dark that Andre Breton, the founder of the surrealist movement, appropriated it for his new publication. Picasso didn't generally refuse admiration, but he had to, had to know that there was a possibility he'd be counted as a surrealist and he wanted nothing to do with that. He transformed his ballet painting after the death of an old friend who had become involved 25 years before with a former mistress of Picasso's. That was the same woman who'd broken the heart of Picasso's great friend, Casa Gemas, and caused his suicide. Well, the death of his friend brought back violent emotions for Picasso, but he said he'd expressed in this picture which seems to portray a struggling trio, including a female creature at the left with a savage face inspired by masks and recalling the Demoiselle d'Avignon. The circumstances of the other painting were milder. Uh, Picasso was looking out his window uh, at a hat maker's workshop across the street. Black and white and beige evidently suited the scene. And he could adapt his cubist style to this insistent pattern of curved forms that he saw dominating the picture of people at work. One of the shocks you get in the galleries of the Picasso Museum in Paris is coming upon this brightly colored picture, only 30 inches wide, of the crucifixion. The more you look, the more you're baffled by the cast of characters. You'd almost think it was a parody, uh, the work of an irreverent non-believer. But Picasso said the crucifixion was the single greatest subject in art. He wasn't a practicing Christian, but he'd been brought up Catholic. 
and was trained to paint Catholic subjects at his father's urging. In fact, uh, as a talented teenager, he painted scenes from the life of Christ and the saints. He was familiar with medieval painting too. And as an adult, he made a study of another important religion of ancient Roman times, Mithraism. The main feat of Mithras was to kill a fearsome bull, an image that Picasso found appealing, as you'll hear shortly. An image in the presence of the moon and the sun. It's been argued that both of those are here in the green blob to the left of Christ and the round yellow form with tiny feet to the right. If you took time, you could identify what most people here are, but you'd be surprised at what's big and what he's chosen to make small. Picasso had his own hierarchy and his own commentary on the event, which we won't have time for, but enough to say that Picasso was terrified of death and valued, indeed glorified, the forces in the world that kept death at bay that prolonged life. Two years later, having traveled to see the most extraordinary crucifixion of all, the altarpiece in Colmar by Grunewald, he returned and drew the scene as though it could be magically reenacted by dry bones, which he piles up in the center to suggest the agonized body of, and head of Christ. Picasso's work in the 1920s, as you've heard, coincided with the Surrealist movement led by André Breton, which he kept his distance from. Nevertheless, the wave of bizarre dreamlike imagery of Surrealist art and poetry was one that Picasso could ride, and he did. His imagery was often fueled by love-hate relationships, embittered ones that developed sooner or later between Picasso and his various and numerous domestic partners. The relationship with Olga degenerated and she wasn't serving as a model anymore, but instead is the subject of several more really unsettling pictures. At the left, Picasso gives her a barely human pliability she has a toothy open mouth and her robe is wide open with nothing concealed. He pumps up the emotional tone with teeth rattling uh, cl color clashes with complementaries of red and green, especially. The other end of the emotional spectrum in the painting at the right, he turns Olga the dancer into carved wood and puts her arms over her head in the fifth position, turning her into something shaped like the little private bathhouses on the Riviera beaches. It isolates her and it fits her like a coffin. The sea is black and so is the sinister sort of spade-like form behind her. I think these distortions are both acts of revenge and practice for Picasso at Olga's expense, practice at expressing the most painful emotions and the most fraught situations between people. All the while, they were living together in a splendid house in Paris where Madame Picasso presided comme il faut. Relations were not improved by Picasso's taking on a 17-year-old mistress two years later, this was a beautiful, athletic, and sexually magnetic girl, Marie-Thérèse Voltaire, who became his model and secret lover for the next 10 years. It was what the surrealists called l'amour fou, a demanding, recklessly consuming, doomed eventually to end, only to be replaced by another more interesting partner, in this case, Dora Maar, Meanwhile, Marie-Thérèse modeled for this famous picture at the Museum of Modern Art. The subject here, a woman looking at herself in a mirror, had been popular since the Middle Ages. Picasso, as a museum goer and a browser of art books, 
would have known the picture in the middle at the top, the Venus by Velasquez, the Spanish countryman. Venus admiring herself with the aid of Cupid. And below, Bellini's allegory of vanity, vanitas, the delusion that beauty can survive time, old age, and if only by implication, death. Picasso on the right there had painted the subject at the age of 25. Now he's over 50. We see her face in full profile, pale lavender, and in yellow, half her face, head on, two aspects of her at once, possible only for an artist to let us see. She looks toward the mirror, which since it's turned towards us, couldn't show her reflection back to her. But it does to us, one side only, in profile, face lavender, but ashen, with a strange carnivalesque kind of face paint, her head heavily swathed as though with a widow's hood. The young woman's chest and lower body are firmly shaped. The reflection though has breasts askew and a wrinkled abdomen. This is an image of many things at once. To quote Robert Rosenblum, youth and old age, sun and moon, light and shadow. I'd add beautiful and ugly, firm and sagging, innocent and knowing, present and future, life and death. The girl reaches out to the, touch the mirror frame as though to a lover, or as though to embrace her other half. It's the privilege of art, if it's let loose from convention, to visualize such a mind-bending collection of paradoxes. Near this picture in the galleries of the Museum of Modern Art, there's another kind of vanitas by Picasso that I need to show you. He painted it at a moment midway through the five years between the two main paintings that we're looking about, to, talking about today, the Guernica of 1937 and the first steps of 1943 during the war. His model for the picture was the successor to Marie Therese, the mother of his child who remained his mistress, but was supplanted by this one, a newer model, literally and figuratively, Dora Maar, lover and in many ways, the new muse. Maar was a serialist photographer. Picasso found her so intense, so beautiful, so erratic, and ultimately so seriously neurotic that he often treated her cruelly. As you can see from the weird creature that Picasso made of her, the troubles had already begun. Notice that he shows her contained in a box, as he'd done with Olga, and also extravagantly distended. Notice her feet, which bring us back to where we started, to first steps, and the role that expressive distortion had come to play in Picasso's work. First, I just want to note um, that uh, children appear by themselves uh, in Picasso's work, either his own three-year-old Maya daughter, whose face in the middle there is the image of his mother's, Marie Therese Voltaire. Picasso shows her on the floor in a kind of defensive posture, keeping a possessive grip on her doll and her toy horse. A few years before First Steps, Picasso paints this boy child on the right with his jumper hiked up, who's delighted by his crayfish and maybe the blue fish on the plate. The subject of a child learning to walk was centuries old. Picasso would have known that. In Rembrandt's Holland, better off people gave babies helmets and had harnesses and even rolling walkers to make the job easier. 
in the 18th century, this was still shown as an activity for women, nursemaids, big sisters, mothers. The painter Marguerite Girard made a specialty out of motherhood. Picasso may not have seen one of Girard's compositions, but it's quite likely he saw this one by Millet on the right, the celebrated 19th century painter of the peasantry. For Millet, it's not an event for well-dressed females, but a front yard affair for working parents. Millet was the inspiration for Vincent van Gogh a century later. And in this case, it was he who was his model. Paintings of this subject were bestsellers when Picasso was growing up. All happy occasions, rites of passage, moments of pride, often in costume, like this one on the right, by a highly successful painter at the annual Paris Salon exhibitions. Bonnard's formula seems to be what Picasso took over, the mother and child facing us. But it's just possible there was another picture in between, a print of several years before by Jean Charlot, a French artist who worked for a couple of years in Mexico, it's closer to Picasso's niche-shaped and more protective mother, and it may just possibly have influenced him. So there's a tradition and maybe influences, but we should ask, what has Picasso contributed? Bonat's picture is charming, with an engaging mother and child, beautifully painted, warmly lighted, intimate in feeling everything calculated to please. So what does Picasso convey that Bonnard doesn't? Well, for me, the size relationship is where it starts. The child absurdly bigger than life, up to his mother's waist if she stood up straight. Then there's what the mother is doing. Instead of looking at us to be admired, she looks anxiously down at the child. There's the child's goofy face, fastened on us out here in the adult world that he wants to join, unselfconsciously twisting his face with concentration. Then there's the casting. Picasso's mom is no attractive Italian contadina in picturesque costume like Bonas but instead a dumpy local lady wearing the plainest, most recessive black, the outfit of millions of ordinary middle-aged Mediterranean women. The child is not taking a little baby step, but a real stride on strong legs and two sturdy feet. He's not naked. He's got a garment that looks like it could protect him, glinting, silver gray, like armor. Picasso's mother is equivocal. She knows there are dangers out there. She's enveloped him in her body, and now he's out of there and ready, but for what, he can't have any idea. She doesn't show pride. She shows worry. She supports him, but in a moment, she's going to have to let him go. Picasso doesn't use any of the realistic techniques of lighting and modeling that he learned from skillful artists by bon like Bonnat. He doesn't need a picturesque setting. His is shallow and barren. The light is flat, casts no shadows. And as a result, the event seems all the more important because indeed it's universal, it's separation. Picasso made a series of drawings that let us see how his idea uh, for the picture developed. One day in 1943, uh, in a park, to judge from the bench at the left, Picasso saw a nursemaid bending down and helping a baby relieve herself. He drew them twice. You can imagine that the simplicity of the arrangement between the two of them and the uh, nurse's solicitous stoop appealed to him. In these drawings of a woman who's no longer a nurse, he tries out expressions, distorting her face, 
you're giving one figure the neckline that survives in the painting. Now he gives her a less anguished face and she, she holds the child. Her neck and shoulders are exaggerated as well as angular. And the child is still small in relation to her. In this painted sketch, the proportions are getting there. She's squat and her outline forms an arch over the child. He still lacks a face though, but Picasso gives him one in this fairly exact drawing that he follows closely in the painting. And the idea that he was thinking of the mother as a kind of niche for the display of the child is confirmed by the study at the left of the head in the drawing. In the painting, though, there's no illusion of emptiness. It's the mother's form that suggests the niche. Now, the feet, the key to the action. He designs them in black with a brush life-size on the sports page of the Paris Soir, almost exactly as he paints them. And he samples the blues that he's going to use for the child's jumper. After the picture was finished, after the Germans retreated from Paris, the picture was included in the revived annual Salon d'Automne, where Picasso had the entire gallery to himself. There had been tremendous interest in what he'd been doing in his studio during the German occupation when he was unable to exhibit. So the result was excitement and on the part of conservative artists, shock at what looked ugly to them, disorganized, disrespectful, even subversive. There were street demonstrations. The picture was shown in New York two years later at the Museum of Modern Art, where it was taken calmly. But in 1948, a New York critic described it as an extremely controversial mother and child, which you might leave alone for the present unless you specialize in controversies. Alfred Barr, the first director of the Museum of Modern Art wrote this about the picture. In a sense, the act of the child in taking its first steps is funny or touching, but for the child himself, it's a moment of crisis in which eagerness, determination, insecurity, and triumph are mingled. Picasso suggests the momentous drama of the scene, not its charm. In this lar large canvas, the child is well over life size so that his raised foot, his face puckered with effort, and the overarching figure of the mother take on something of the monumental character, as well as the intensity of a Romanesque mural. My theme today has been life and death. Now I'm gonna turn from this life affirming picture to one of the most moving responses to death any artist has ever attempted. We turn the clock back seven years to just before World War I, two rather, and to this picture that Picasso painted in Paris for the Spanish government during the Spanish Civil War, which Picasso lent to the Museum of Modern Art in 1939 and remained there for 42 years during all my time in school and university. After General Franco finally died and a constitutional monarchy was established, it was given to Spain. In January, 1937, Picasso was 56 years old. He was a wealthy international celebrity. He was living on the right bank in Paris in great comfort. And he had a new love, the surrealist photographer Dora Maar, whom you've met earlier, and also separately, a wife and child and much stress. At the beginning of 1937, a delegation came in to see him from the Spanish government, the embattled constitutional government, and asked him to paint a mural for the Spanish pavilion at the World's Fair that was going to open in Paris in May, just four months away. That's the pavilion. 
a small modernist building designed by Jose Sert. And as you can see on the right, dwarfed by those two bombastic towers, the German and the Soviet pavilions. It was also propaganda, but propaganda to generate sympathy and admiration for the Spanish Republican regime, which had been under attack for a year and a half by a right-wing military faction, the Nationalists, led by General Franco and supported by Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. Madrid had been bombed and other Spanish cities were besieged. Picasso wasn't inclined to take sides publicly in the Civil War. Despite being proudly left-leaning Spaniard and strongly sympathetic to the government, he'd been happy when he was appointed honorary director of the Prado. And he was shocked when German bombers of the Condor Legion damaged the museum, fortunately after the paintings had been removed. Picasso had already been provoked to go on the attack. First, he chose the method that came naturally to him, satirical images and poetry. He made two large etchings that he designed to be cut up and distributed as postcards at the fair. There at the upper right, he makes General Franco a worm-like creature with a mustache and a grin. He's off like a knight errant on a mission of destruction without purpose. And he's confronted now and then by a bull representing Spain. At the end, the last four panels, Franco's mission causes death and destruction to innocent women and children. These last four were done after the news of the bombing of Guernica in April. Guernica is a market town of about 7,000 people near Bilbao in the Basque country in the far north of Spain. It had a bridge and a road crossing that on April 26 was the target of a three hour bombardment followed by strafing runs and more incendiary bombs that destroyed the plaza and the market square in the center of town. Fires burned for three days. Several hundred civilians died. The bridge survived. This was mechanized terrorism. This was Blitzkrieg, pure and simple. Democratic governments in Europe and America were officially non-interventionists. So when they should have condemned the attack, they stayed silent. In Paris on May Day, just a couple of days later, more than a million protesters mar marched in sympathy. Picasso then decided that his mural for the Spanish pavilion would memorialize the terror of Guernica. Let's take a minute or two just to look at the picture. Picasso had 24 days to design and carry out a mural painting some 25 feet wide and almost 12 feet high. Beginning on May 1st, he threw himself at the project. The finished painting is in black and white and gray, like a newspaper or magazine illustration. <laughs> Near the apex of a pyramid of bodies, there's the head of a horse twisted, screaming in fear under a blazing electric light. <laughs> Next to it, there's a kerosene lantern held by one of the two shocked women with open mouth profiles. At the base of the pyramid, you make out a man stretched out, mouth open, eyes askew, holding a broken sword in his right hand. Above him is the horse's twisted body. 
kneeling on a, on a crumpled leg. The other four figures are all women. At the far right, behind some flaming debris, a woman cries out with her arms flung up, and behind her there's a burning building. In front of her is another woman, half naked, rushing toward the center, and above her, a woman's head and stretched out neck emerge from a window. Her mouth is open in horror, and she extends long arms holding a lantern. Over at the far left, a bull with distorted eyes and a half comprehending expression twists around. He's standing over a mother who sits on the ground and throws her head back and screams as she holds her dead baby in her lap. It's a scene shattered by some terrific violence that we don't actually see. Don't see warplanes, no enemy, no particular time or place. We see the results. No cause, just effect just victims and their incomprehensible pain. All this you can see from a distance as you'd expect from a public mural, and it's worth inspecting up close. I think it may also be helpful to retrace Picasso's steps since a lot changed during the weeks it took him to plan the picture and carry it out. It's been assumed that the bombing of Guernica was the beginning of Picasso's project. But 30 years ago, Herschel Chip produced a surprise, which was a parcel of drawings that Picasso made for the Spanish pavilion a week before the bombing, drawings that had been in storage for many years. The drawing below shows the composition of another subject for the mural entirely different, to say the least, an artist's studio with a female artist standing and a nude model stretched out on the couch. And you can see the easel and the model and the artist with two very long arms. And the composition has a wide rectangular shape. Well, this is a subject uh, Picasso had painted and drawn many times in the past. At the right is a drawing of six years earlier. They used the mistress, his mistress, uh, Marie Therese Voltaire, as the, as the nude model in a typically voluptuous pose, being painted though by a female artist. I think that's because for centuries, the art of painting had been personified by the allegorical figure of pictura. So the female painter in Picasso's design was traditional and Picasso, I think, knew that. Of all his subjects, none was more important to Picasso than this one, because his work and his loves for him were life itself. Though the Spanish Civil War was raging in April 1937, there's no hint yet in the picture of the idea here of anything political, let alone military. In any case, after Guernica was bombed, he dropped the studio as a subject and as Chip wrote, he returned to focusing on his power, on his suffering of his fellow Spaniards. Picasso began on May 1st by dreaming up a bullfight episode, which may seem very strange subject to commemorate the bombing of civilians. It came naturally to Picasso. He'd been fascinated all his life by the corrida, the ritual combat involving a matador who's work didn't actually interest Picasso much, but which broke down sometimes into mayhem, which interested Picasso a lot, particularly into a fatal encounter between an enraged bull and a handsome defenseless horse. He didn't have far to go for a precedent. Goya's etchings of the bull ring there at the bottom had always fascinated him. His quick sketch 
on blue paper at the upper right already has the core of the painting. A bull at the left with banderillas, the dying horse on the ground in the center with one leg in the air, and a woman with a lamp looking out at them from a window. At the lower left is another drawing of that first day, refining the idea and adding a dead man on the ground. Not a matador, but an ancient warrior with a spear and a Greek helmet. Now the wounded horse is screaming and collapsing in a tangle with the hindquarters of the bull. The next day, at the upper right, the horse has collapsed into a contorted pose. The warrior's lance is broken and he's lying on top of a dead woman. The bull is leaping in the air. The woman with a lamp is there again, and she stays there throughout all the changes to come. Six days later, Picasso makes the drawing at the bottom right. He's now taking account of the horizontal format of the mural, and he makes a composition that's wider and more param pyramidal with the horse and warrior. A new motif appears. The mother with one breast exposed and one arm supporting the limp body of her baby the arm propping her up as she howls in agony. Picasso studies that group again and again, as he does in the pen drawing at the bottom left. The composition sketch that we have, the last one uh, on the lower right um, is this. The, there are many elements that are gonna survive in the canvas and some that won't. It now has an illusion of space created by angular forms to the left and the right, and it has light and shade. The bull has become an alien and alert presence. There are many more victims piled up on the ground together. The following day, Picasso picked up colored crayons and made a series of amazing studies to test whether the bright colors would add strength to the mural. They're wonderful gripping drawings, but Picasso abandoned that experiment. And the day after that, Picasso started on his 25 foot canvas and worked on it for a month. His companion at the time, the photographer Dora Mar, took at least 10 photographs while the work was going on. So we can follow how the composition evolved from the drawing stage. At the top, you see again, the last of the composition drawings and underneath the first photograph of the huge canvas. A lot has already been added and some removed and shifted around. He's added the woman at the right who's falling, flinging out her arms and he's rearranged the dying warrior, rotating him 180 degrees. His feet are together and his arms are splayed out like Christ on the cross. And with one arm, he gives the clenched fist salute, the traditional communist gesture that the Spanish Republic had adopted. This makes the warrior even more obviously a victim. Picasso added long rays of light cast by the sun, which he hadn't yet drawn. Now I put the finished painting on the top. In the canvas in progress, at the bottom to the right of center, he adds a peaceful looking female corpse on the ground. She's gonna disappear. At the far left, he's moved the desperate mother with her dead baby over to beneath the bull where she will stay. The photograph shows the next state of the canvas with some dark areas and with blazing sun and a hand holding a sheaf of wheat, both of them conventional symbols of the agricultural proletariat. 
Picasso evidently thought better of including all this pol obvious political freight, and he painted over it. Again, at the bottom, with the sun and sheaf gone, he could move the dying horse and make the head and the scream of the horse the most powerful thing in the picture, the most prominent, and maybe the most unforgettable. Looking just below the horse's neck, we see now that the horse has been stabbed by a spear, not gored by the bull's horns. In other words, it's a human weapon, a human act. The tangle of corpses has become a single man face down. Picasso studied that area in a few drawings, and then he repainted it, as you see in the finished picture, entangling the warrior in the horse's legs and giving him eyes askew in blindness and mouth open in horror. We've been trying to follow Picasso's train of thought during the process of conceiving and working out the painting. You saw him begin with a core element, the bull and the horse. It got more and more complex in his drawings and the early phases of the painting becoming a, a melee until he simplified it radically. His power would have to be derived from its organization, how the shapes and the relationships carry the story and how distorted impressions, expressions and impossible body language carry it farther. Picasso was making a work that was unusual for him in every way it was going to be a public work of great size, made on commission, occasioned by an event of universal moral consequence. It would be a work of history painting, in other words, a category of art that for centuries had been defined as the most elevated of all. There were a great many important examples in the Prado and the Louvre that Picasso knew very well. He knew this painting from the time of his boyhood, a condemnation of official brutality. In May 1808, after Napoleon's army had invaded Spain and installed a French government, there was an uprising of civilians in Madrid. In reprisal and to terrify the public, the French marshal ordered that rebels and suspects be rounded up and shot to death, and hundreds were. After the French were expelled six years later, Goya persuaded the new government to have him memorialize the atrocity in a painting. Light heightens the terror here, and the plight of the ragged, vulnerable citizens confronted by inhuman military precision is expressed in a way that's hard to forget. But in the Spanish Civil War, photography demonstrated that life can imitate art. It was the first war that was documented with thousands of photographs, were made possible by the development of lightweight cameras and fast roll film, and by brave reporters. Dozens of illustrated magazines and newspapers published their pictures, and there were newsreels week after week, sometimes with live action. So the job of documentation of the war was already accomplished. How would Picasso create a single image to put across the senseless horror of it all? Picasso knew that his mural could earn him a place in that great tradition of painting, which since the Renaissance aimed to sharpen the moral sensibilities of the audience. He knew he'd be judged by criteria that in the 1930s weren't being applied to art very often, but would be the test in the future for Guernica. Jericho's Raft of the Medusa has to be, has to have been in Picasso's mind, I think. It pictured a horrible event. After the French naval frigate Medusa was wrecked 
147 people were put on an improvised raft and set adrift for two weeks. And all but a dozen of them died of starvation and exposure. The blame was laid on an unqualified captain and an incompetent naval administration. The picture aimed to keep the scandal in the public eye, and it's done that ever since, not just because of the grisly details of suffering or the high drama of the light dark contrasts, but because it's all pulled together into a single great eloquent pyramid. Here again is Picasso's pyramid of suffering. We've only gotten part way in deducing Picasso's many messages, and that's inevitable. He, he never meant those messages to be fixed or definitive in any of his works. In his great book on Guernica, Herschel Chip, who knew Picasso, quotes him in a passage that applies very well to the painting. The picture is not thought out and settled beforehand, Picasso told him. While it's being done, it changes as one's thoughts change. And when it is finished, it still goes on changing according to the state of mind of whoever's looking at it. A picture lives a life like a living creature, undergoing the changes imposed on it and on us by our life from day to day. This is natural enough as the picture lives only through the person who is looking at it. Eight years after Guernica, as World War II was ending, Picasso painted another memorial, a last reflection on suffering and death. The newspapers had been carrying ghastly pictures of dead Russian civilians and of the Nazi concentration camps. And those evidently stirred Picasso to act out the horror in this one large painting, showing a man and a woman and a child, life-sized, piled up on one another under a table that has a still life that Picasso simply outlined. The man's arms are thrust up and his hands are bound. So he's been captive and possibly tortured. The woman has been bleeding. It's hard to look at the picture and even to talk about it. And I think that's because so much is not revealed. You're asked to imagine what might have happened. And it's your terrible imagining that your mind bears away and keeps. In Picasso's words, the, the picture lives only through the person who's looking at it. Picasso is 64 when he paints this. He had almost 30 more years of life and work ahead of him, and he wasted no time in moving in new directions as a painter and a sculptor. As you visit museums, you're going to come on later works by Picasso that take you by surprise with their daring, whether it's conceiving of a scene in the kitchen as a maze or as a monumental wiring diagram, or conceiving of his mistress, Jacqueline Roque, as an exotic houseplant, or imagining one of his favorite subjects, bathers on the beach, as an assemblage of driftwood, life-sized totems, or playthings, or playmates. Picasso never let go of the artists he most admired. At the age of 75, he spent five months grappling with the greatest of all his long dead rivals, Velázquez, in a series of imaginative variations of Las Meninas, the picture that had lived in his mind his whole life. And he returns to universal subjects of human cru cruelty and victimization again and again. This little painting in the Yale Art Gallery seems like a good one to end on. Picasso's 84 when he paints it. He's been binging on this subject and there are a dozen of pictures of artists in their studio, all different. 
Here, Picasso, or his imaginary counterpart, seems to be wearing his palette on his chest as an insignia, maybe as a talisman covering his heart. He's intent on his work. His mouth is open in concentration, and his eyes seem to beam his entire attention on his subject, and only that. I hope these talks have been useful to you in one way or another. I've been thankful to you all along for your attention and your patience with this flood of words about Picasso. I'm hoping that the images on your screen have encouraged you to go back to museums and look at the works in the original. Take a friend, and when you get there, don't be in a hurry. Thank you.